So we'll just do it on YouTube. Okay. All right. Okay, so we'll get started. Um, thanks everybody for being here tonight and for attending this lecture, both in person and for those of you following online. Um, I'm excited to do this series of talks we're going to be doing over the next few months here, uh, hopefully to help bring awareness to the Overland Park community about you know, the Reardon Clinic, our approach, uh, and how we can help patients not only with, with cancer, but suffering from all chronic diseases. Um, my talk tonight will be mainly sort of an introduction as to you know, what I'm all about, what, what my training has been, uh, we'll talk specifically about naturopathic oncology, uh, and then the subsequent talks, we'll look at more specific therapies that we offer at, at our clinic, like IV vitamin C and mistletoe therapy. A little background on me, uh, I'm Dr. Lucas Timms, I'm a naturopathic doctor and I'm board certified in naturopathic oncology. I've uh, been in practice for eight years, mostly out in Arizona, where I worked pretty exclusively at uh, Cancer Treatment Centers of America. I'm originally from, from Fayetteville, Arkansas, so uh, moving back here recently to join the staff at, uh, for the Reardon Clinic uh, is kind of returning back home to me and closer to family. Uh, and we've really been uh, impressed with the community here and um, you know just the uh, you know warmth that we've gotten here so far. So uh, we'll do a little bit of uh, just a roadmap here so you guys can get an idea of what we'll be talking about. We'll talk, like I said, we'll define naturopathic oncology, discuss my training and what it means to become a board certified naturopathic oncologist. We'll discuss some of the patient demand that's uh, been measured and that's created the niche and the, the void, as I like to call it, that, that uh, is out there between you know, patients that want to utilize natural therapies and you know the conventional side that doesn't really um, have much to offer them in that way. And then we'll also talk about you know, some of the, the research in our in, in, in naturopathic medicine, naturopathic oncology, as well as some of the really well substantiated therapies and evidence-based therapies that we're already utilizing. We'll do a few case studies just so you guys can get kind of that real world feel for how I work with patients and, and, and what types of therapies I recommend. And then we'll have a little bit of time for some questions. So I'm a naturopathic oncologist, like I said, but my, my degree is in naturopathic medicine. Naturopathic medicine is a specific approach to medicine. Our, Training looks very similar to a medical school as far as the MDs and DOs go through. Uh, the curriculum is very, very similar. We go through basic sciences, clinical sciences. We learn how to, you know, diagnose and, and work up lab work and um, physical exams. All that type of stuff is, is, is all the same. Where it differs is on the treatment side and the philosophy side. So the treatments that they're weaving in throughout our training are, you know, more to do with nutrition and uh, supplements, herbs, vitamins, Chinese medicine, homeopathy, acupuncture. We have tons of tools that were, that were given. And, um, and then the philosophy is more of, more of a patient-focused philosophy in, con in contrast to the conventional side, which tends to be much more disease-focused. So we're, you know, we're looking more at how do we change the soil and the terrain of our patients and what are the root causes of their disease as opposed to, you know, how is this particular disease state playing out and how is it manifesting in symptoms and labs and scans and things like that. Not that we don't take that into consideration, but it's just a little bit more of a, of a fundamental shift in the way that we approach patient care. So the medical school part of it's very similar. Uh, and then obviously all medical doctors and osteopathic doctors are going into residency and specialized training once they complete their medical school. And that can be anywhere from two to five or even seven more years for some really highly specialized type surgeons. Um, so where naturopathic medicine kind of falls short is that we don't quite 
practice and they can show a certain number of oncology patient hours. They're able to submit cases and, and you know, case reports that are looked at and make, you know, they're kind of uh, very closely examined to make sure that these doctors are practicing within our scope and practicing within the guidelines of what, of what the, the board of naturopathic oncology, uh, you know, uh, uh, has, has published. So then, if you're in either two of those camps, you're able to sit for your board exam, and then if you pass, you know, you become a fellow of the American Board of Naturopathic Oncology. It is a 10-year recertification, so, um, which I think is a good thing. It keeps people, you know, fresh and up, and up to date on current practices. Uh, so I'll be, I'll be due here in another five or six years, and anxious about that. <laughs> So I talked about the naturopathic approach and it really is more of a holistic, whole person uh, care. There's lots of different principles in naturopathic medicine, but I highlighted some of the few that really apply, I think, to cancer care. Um, this, you know, the fact that cancer is a multi-dimensional disease, I think that it fits with our, our concept that the health is inseparable from the body, mind, spirit, and the environment, which I think the environment sometimes often gets left out talking about health uh, and in cancer it's so crucial to identify issues in the patient's environment because we know that that's where a lot of our carcinogens are coming from whether it's in, you know beauty products or you know, the air we're breathing the, the, the food the food we're eating water we're drinking um, the environment's a important piece of that puzzle and I think oftentimes gets unaddressed um, you know the body the body has a wisdom and we do believe that the body has an innate ability to heal itself when we support it in the right way and we remove obstacles to cure, okay? And so a lot of times what we're doing are not necessarily adding things onto patients' plates, but we're taking things off and removing these things that might be impeding their body's own ability to heal itself. And some of that's done through lifestyle, some of that's done through diet, um, some of that's done through mind-body, some of that's done through healing up the gut so that the immune system can work better. Uh, it's uh, it's there's lots of obstacles usually with cancer patients and so that's where a lot of detective work is, is usually done um, lifestyle factors like I said are huge uh, they play a role in that environment they play a role in um, in removing obstacles and then this concept that every individual has a you know a biochemical uniqueness or individuality and so uh, you know I don't know how many people are aware of the fact that most tumors are very, if you take a, a biopsy from one side and analyze it and look at all the different mutations, and then you take a biopsy from the other side of the tumor, you get different information. There's a lot of bit of, there's a lot of variability even amongst a, a single tumor. And so this is showing us that what's driving some cells is not driving other cells, okay? And so this is where the biochemical uniqueness kind of plays a role in that we we have to take that into account that it's not just a one size fits all approach, right? It's not that, okay, this person, these 20 people have breast cancer or lung cancer, here's the prescription for that. It's what's going on in each one of these patients that makes them different. And those are oftentimes the clues to what are the root causes and what are driving those patients' issues. Um, MD, and, you know, MDs, obviously, we can take more time to listen to patients, and I think that's very important. We're not usually part of the uh, insurance model, so we're able to spend, you know, I spend at least an hour and a half with my new patients. Usually, you know, very frequently that, that leads into two hours or more uh, because it takes time for patients to tell their story and you don't want to miss things. And you want to give that space because it's therapeutic as well for patients to tell their story and therapeutic for them to be heard and be listened to. And I. I take that very seriously, and so I think that that's where that that trust and that um, rapport with your patients really starts is, is listening to them, making them feel like they've been heard, and um, and and acknowledging all the issues that they're that they're dealing with on multiple levels. Um, and then this last one, you know, patients are educated to take an active role. It's it, it's a relationship, right? It's not I'm up here, I'm the doctor, and you're down here, and this is what you're going to do. It's okay, let's come together. I've got some knowledge and, and tools and guidance I can give you, but at the end of the day, you need to engage and execute the plan, right? 
So that's that's this doctor-patient relationship. And uh, Reardon Clinic, uh, we call it our, our co-learners, right? Because we're we're learning together. Um, uh, the, the patients we learn as much from our patients as they they do from us. So this section on patient demand. Um, just throwing in a few, you know, slides with statistics and numbers, and I don't want people to get too, you know, bogged down in, in, in the different, you know, percentages and all that. But the overall theme is, we know that cancer patients are heavy users of natural therapies, and while that's a good thing, it also creates a gap in their care because most oncologists are not talking to patients about these natural therapies. They're not and nor are they equipped to, okay? A lot of patients you know, want to discuss natural therapies, natural options with oncologists, and you know, I think some of them are you know, ashamed or they, they feel embarrassed or they don't want to upset them, or maybe they've had past experiences with doctors that haven't gone well when they brought up natural therapies. Uh, there's lots of dynamics at play there, uh, but it really creates this gap, okay? And it really creates niche and a need for physicians like myself who have training and expertise in how to safely apply natural therapies to patients going through cancer care um, and it's, it's not always a you know it's a not always a an alternative it, a lot of times what we do is complementary and supportive to what patients are receiving on the conventional side uh, our you know number one priority is to keep patients safe with natural therapies a lot of patients tend to doctor themselves or, you know, there's just so much information out there on the internet, in books, magazines, on TV. Uh, and, you know, most patients kind of get just, you know, pieces of the puzzle and they kind of strew it together themselves. And, and it doesn't end up being a real focused, guided plan for them in order to really work on the things that need to be worked on and address the situations with the correct types of therapies. So. My whole point for putting this information here is just to, for you guys to realize that uh, this need is, is, is huge. And I think a lot of cancer centers are getting on board because of these statistics. You see a lot of these major cancer centers that are bringing on in integrated medicine departments. And even if it's just starting with you know, an acupuncturist or getting nutritionists in there, we're building momentum, okay? And me working in you know that that integrative setting at Cancer Treatment Centers of America for eight years, um, I can tell you that the medical oncologists, the radiation oncologists, they get on board so quickly and are so supportive once they see us and experience how we bring benefit to that whole model and take a lot of that pressure off of them to be able to you know, focus on what they're trained to do and not have to feel embarrassed because they don't you know, know about natural medicine or they just you know, have you know, these unbased fears or skepticism about it. And so when they're able to speak to someone on a physician level that that does have expertise and training in these things and knows how to apply it in a way where it supports and doesn't take away from what they're doing, uh, the medical oncologists become very, very supportive. So even some of the ones that are you know the most kind of anti-natural medicine when they start, I saw their, their walls kind of break down very quickly uh, and almost become some of our biggest supporters. So uh, the need is there both on the patient side and you know, I think conventional medicine, whether they realize it or not, um, that need is there as well. So just more statistics here, uh, kind of painting that picture. And then the, you know, this is a, a large survey of kind of attitudes and practice patterns for oncologists. Some oncologists are discussing supplements with patients. I don't know what makes me more scared are the, the ones that do discuss it with them or the ones that don't because, you know, they could be not giving them the correct information. Um, and so I think that uh, there's multiple reasons why oncologists need integrative support, integrative doctors on their team, uh, referring patients to integrative doctors to, to help to navigate all of this because there really is a lot to navigate. And they might know a little bit about, you know, say vitamin D or CoQ10 or fish oil, but in order to bring all of that together in a, in a dynamic fashion with all the other therapies they got going on and be aware of herb drug interactions and 
you know, what types of diets might be best for patients, ARBs. It's, it, it's not just herbs and vitamins, okay? There's a whole lot to integrative oncology, naturopathic oncology. And, um, and again, this just kind of paints that. So from a research perspective, um, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to talk about the fact that there is good research uh, for supporting natural therapies in cancer care, but I also wanted to highlight the fact that, um, you know, it's, it's a very slow process and we don't uh, get a lot of the, the perks that the conventional side get with big pharma, you know, money and large academic uh, institutions throwing tons of manpower at churning out studies. And so we're working with a, with a, with a much smaller support system. Uh, uh, and I think they'll, you know, in some ways we might always be swimming uphill, uh, but I do think that there's an issue with the type of research model that we use. I don't think that the pharmaceutical model really matches up with the way that we should be studying and evaluating holistic approaches and system approaches to medicine and, and oncology specifically. Uh, you know, we have these single intervention, or, you know, randomized controlled trials, which are great when you're looking at what does this one compound or this one drug do for this one, you know, mutation or this one, you know, disease state or, or pathogen. But when you talk about the naturopathic approach or uh, a holistic approach, oftentimes, again, going back to multi-dimensional approach we're working on different dimensions we're working on diet we're working on you know the mind-body connection we're working on cleaning up the environment we're working on stimulating different pathways in the body to help assist with you know the body's innate ability to heal and so I think sometimes when you're just looking at individual interventions that whole approach can get missed especially on the natural on the naturopathic side so I know there's people working, very smart people working on different research models that will better capture the effectiveness of, of a holistic approach. And I think that, you know, it's going to take time, but I think once we get there, uh, you know, it'll really be, things will take off in the research world. Uh, with that said, the research that we do have is overwhelmingly positive, you know, and so we are still able to make evidence-based recommendations. Uh, for the most part on most therapies that have been looked at uh, and we try to you know we try to stick to what does the evidence show you know there are uh, other forms of evidence besides you know randomized controlled trials uh, there's you know there are case series and you know more experiential type anecdotal evidence uh, i know myself i get a lot of uh, i get a lot of help going to conferences and speaking with doctors that i know i've spent a lot of time working with certain therapies or working with certain patient populations and just having those curbside conversations and figuring out what's working for them in their practice. What are they seeing clinically? And so I think that, you know, that there's, there's lots of ways to learn, lots of ways to practice evidence-based medicine uh, and do it in a, in, a, in a smart and logical way without having to, you know, cite 50 million studies that this is what supports this intervention and this, this different So we'll talk a little bit about some of the specific therapies that um, do have good resources behind them, and I broke it up into three categories. The first category is has to do more with what I've shown to have improved outcomes in cancer patients. So better survival rate, better progression-free survival, better response to conventional treatment. Um, the first one, IV vitamin C. Uh, this is, you know, it, it was number one for a reason. It's uh, something that the Reardon Clinic's been, uh, you know, a real leader in as far as uh, uh, establishing safe protocols for IV, high dose IV vitamin C, uh, not only for cancer patients, but for other types of chronic diseases. Uh, they are really, they really set the, set the template for what all the other institutions around that are, are utilizing IV vitamin C is all based off of Reardon Clinic's original research. And so this is something that is a real cornerstone for integrative oncology and really can be used, you can make a case, you know, across the whole continuum as far as prevention, uh, side effect support, uh, improving outcomes, and 
improving quality of life. And so this is something that I use with you know pretty much all of my patients. You know, we have a, a slogan at Reardon Clinic where it's IV, IVC first. And that's usually one of the first treatments that we start because it always gets patients moving in the right, the right direction. Mistletoe therapy uh, is another one that that I use a lot with my patients. We're kind of bringing it on as a, as a new entity here at the Reardon Clinic, but uh, it's, still a, it's still a fairly unknown uh, therapy, at least here in the States. Uh, it's used very heavily in Europe and some Asian countries as well. Uh, I did some training in Germany uh, with some of the, uh, the leaders and the, and the real experts in the field of mistletoe therapy. So I've been using it for several years now and, excited to bring this therapy on as another way to help support our patients. It mainly is working through the immune system. So we know that, again, going back to the body's ability to you know, heal itself innately, we want to harness that immune system, right? And so mistletoe, uh, the compound viscum album, which is the, you know, the, the herbal name for it, uh, it, it contains these compounds called lectins. And these lectins create an immune response in the body. It's mainly given by injection. Uh, patients do, you know, self injections. We kind of, you know, get them started and then teach them how to do them at home. And um, this is something that has shown in multiple studies, uh, both alongside chemo and by a standalone agent, um, to help improve overall outcomes in several different types of, of cancers. Uh, so another real cornerstone therapy. Ketogenic diet. Um, this is. You know, kind of a hot topic, not just in oncology, but you know, you kind of hear it all over the place now for people that are trying to lose weight, or you know, people that are, you know, it always comes up big in the CrossFit community, and, and uh, some of those types of communities are, are big with the ketogenic diet. But it actually has really good evidence, especially in brain tumors, of, of improving response rates to conventional treatment. So we recommend it not only for brain tumors. I've seen a lot of benefits in, in other types of uh, tumor types as well. Uh, and it, it does create some dramatic weight loss at first, but then long term, a lot of patients end up holding on to their muscle mass a lot better than, say, a typical standard American diet. Uh, it is a difficult diet to sustain. So we usually recruit, you know, an integrative dietitian to help walk patients through you know, how they can implement the diet and, and really stay in that, key, that ketogenic state. Uh, because if you're not really getting your, your, your body's metabolism to where it's burning those, fat, those fats instead of sugars, you're not really getting the, the true benefits of the diet. So you really need someone that can give you that, that guidance. And we have some dietitians that we work with that can, that can give you that education. And, you know, we refer our patients to them quite readily. Curcumin, I'll talk about more in the prevention slide as well, but uh, one of our best um, anti-cancer herbs, it's also very anti-inflammatory. Uh, it's been shown to be synergistic with some chemotherapies as well. Uh, some people do it IV. Uh, we mainly do it just through oral forms, which is, I haven't seen much evidence that has shown that the IV um, application is much better than the oral application. Um, melatonin, this is something that, um, you know, I have a lot of patients on. It's, uh, it is, uh, I kind of call it my Swiss Army knife supplements because it has so many different benefits in the body. Most people just know that as a sleep aid, but it's been shown to help with, with the immune uh, digestion, with detoxification, with hormone balancing. Um, and we'll also see on the prevention side that a lot of, or some tumor types have been associated with a lack of melatonin uh, production. So for most cancer patients, we're trying to get them up to higher dose melatonin than what they would take for sleep. So there is a way that we have patients kind of titrated up uh, and a 20 milligram dose is kind of where we shoot for with patients. Vitamin D3, this is, um, you know, actually really well researched as opposed to most other vitamins and herbs. Uh, even in the, in the conventional medical literature, uh, a lot of doctors now are, you know, even your, your family doctor, they're all checking vitamin D levels because we know that there's a, just a huge amount of deficiencies out there. You know, part of that's due to lack of sun exposure. You know, most of us work indoors all day. Uh, and when we're outside, we're covering up with, with uh, you know, sunscreen, which blocks vitamin D as well. But we also know that chronic diseases, especially like cancer, further deplete our body of vitamin D stores. 
vitamin D3 has been shown, it's actually more like a hormone than a vitamin. It, uh, it acts on just about every tissue in our body. Almost all of our cells have vitamin D receptors. And um, when that vitamin D is not, when there's not enough vitamin D in the system, you're not getting a adequate immune response a lot of the times. Uh, you can have cardiovascular uh, dysfunction. Uh, it's been linked with other chronic diseases like autoimmune diseases, MS. But specifically in cancer patients, uh, low vitamin D has been associated with worse outcomes. You know, it's almost been like a, a prognostic indicator. So we want to get patients up to a certain level. Uh, most cancer patients, we're trying to get them up around the 70 to 80 uh, nanogram per milliliter. And so uh, that's something you got to keep an eye on because if patients uh, you know, aren't taking enough or you know, they go off it for a while, I've seen the numbers, they can just plummet really quickly again. Uh, artemisinin, this is something that uh, I'm still sort of dipping my toes into, but uh, there's a, a form of it that's approved by the FDA to treat malaria, called artisanate. It comes from the, uh, the herb wormwood, sweet wormwood, and just recently in the past five years, it's been shown to have a number of different mechanisms by which it can, um, it can help with cancer and help to prevent the cancer spread and also help to kill cancer cells. It actually works through a um, sort of a Trojan horse mechanism by riding iron into the cancer cells, which cancer cells kind of, they love iron. You know, they love an iron rich environment and they love to pull iron into their body because it helps them with their, with the cell turnover. Um, but that's something that I'm still, um, you know, kind of getting, getting educated on. It, it's a therapy that I have used a little bit that's something that does have good evidence behind it and that I think will continue to get more more momentum and I think will we'll hopefully become more mainstream. Uh, it's given both IV and orally. Uh, I mainly have done only the oral forms, but uh, some people say that the IV tends to, tends to have a, a better response, so that might be something we look at. Uh, medicinal mushrooms, these things are just uh, you know, loaded with great evidence. Uh, lots of studies out of Asia in humans showing, you know, patients going through chemo, adding these medicinal mushrooms in, doing much better than patients just on standard chemo. Uh, they help mainly through the immune system again. Uh, the beta-glucans are the main compound within these mushrooms that are stimulating the immune system. And so I use a lot of these with my patients, uh, especially if they're dealing with, you know, low blood counts from their chemo or the low blood counts from radiation. You can really see a dramatic improvement by, by having these on board. Uh, some of the ones that I use uh, pretty often are like reishi, maitake, coriolis, uh, cordyceps is another one. So again, really good research behind these therapies. And you know, these lists aren't all inclusive. Uh, I just am hitting some of the highlights uh, and some of the, the big hitters that we do have really good research on. So this next, this next category of therapies that I mentioned, uh, this one's gonna be more about side effect support. And this is, again, another way which we can really help patients when they are going through conventional treatment to help lower that, you know, either mitigate those side effects or sometimes we're able to completely prevent them if we start things early on enough in their treatment. Uh, acupuncture, I think, is something that most patients can benefit from. It's great for helping with nausea and vomiting with fatigue, with uh, certain pain syndromes, neuropathy. You know, these are all very common side effects of, of, key, of conventional treatments. So uh, most of my patients all refer for acupuncture very early on in their treatment. Um, ginseng is something that's been shown in a lot of studies. Uh, Mayo, Mayo Clinic did a great study with ginseng and cancer-related fatigue, and it did show a pretty significant improvement uh, after you know, being on ginseng for a few months. The thing with a lot of these supplements is, and a lot of these therapies, natural therapies, is you don't oftentimes get that immediate effect, right? So we tell patients that you know, sometimes you're really gonna have to bear with us and buy in for the long haul because it can take a few months for some of these things to start playing out um, and manifesting into improved symptoms and improved um, fatigue and, 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 and different things that patients might be dealing with. So. A lot of times patients are used to that model where, you know, I have an ailment and I want a pill and I'll feel better next, you know, tomorrow. 
Natural medicine doesn't necessarily work like that. Sometimes it does, and we're always happy for that, but we always try to set the expectations for patients that, you know, this is, these are, you know, these are slow working things, but if you stick to them and, and commit to them, you'll get long-term success. And that's part of what we talked about earlier about the, the patients engaging and executing and buying in and, and doing what they need to do on their side. Exercise, again, I mean, you know, exercise should be a no-brainer, but it's really been shown to help with fatigue and cancer patients, with stabilizing lean muscle mass, with sleep disturbances. Um, so a lot of patients, somewhere along the line, they get the notion that they shouldn't exercise when they're going through treatment, that they should just, you know, camp out, stay in bed, you know, eat soup and, you know, don't do anything. That's the furthest from the truth. You know, we want our patients to stay active. We want our patients to be um, exercising. You know, there's actually specific types of exercises that have evidence behind them for specific situations and specific types of cancer. Um, if you look at breast cancer, yoga has been a specific, has look, been looked at specifically as a type of exercise that is more beneficial than other types of exercise. Uh, you look at things like Tai Chi, it's been shown to be specific, a specific type of exercise for specific types of tumors where those patients do better with that type of exercise. So uh, if patients aren't doing exercise, I'm just happy to get them start moving. But in some cases, we're actually prescribing specific types of exercise for those patients. Uh, Mind-body therapies, you know, um, again, there's a whole range of these types of things out there. Uh, it's kind of a, an umbrella term, but it's everything from, you know, Mindful, uh, mindful-based stress reduction techniques, meditation, deep breathing, guided imagery, um, you know, even some of the more uh, faith-based type type things that are out there. Uh, there's a lot of uh, biofeedback, a big one, because uh, a lot of patients are exposed to a specific type of chemo called doxorubicin, adriamycin. It's very common in breast cancer regimens, and this carries with it a, a significant risk of Cardiotoxicity in patients. And usually it happens, you know, years later. Uh, but we actually have some fairly good studies showing that if you supplement patients with CoQ10, which does have a lot of heart health impact, uh, you significantly mitigate and reduce that risk of them developing heart issues down the road. So that one almost should be a no brainer. And that's one that I've actually seen some of our medical oncologists, you know, they're already, they're, they already are aware of that, that benefit and the research data that's out there. And, they recommend it before I do. So that's great too. Um, zinc can help with taste changes and alterations in smell and even some gastrointestinal type side effects. Uh, cannabis, this is always a big topic. Um, you know, medical marijuana is still in kind of a, you know, a nebulous state uh, you know, as far as nationwide. We, of course, we have some states that are fully legal, some states that aren't, some states that just have it for medical purposes. It's still considered, uh, you know, a Schedule One drug, which makes it very hard to do clinical studies on. Um, but with that said, we do have a lot of uh, evidence for its use in cancer care because there is, you know, there are medications that are that contain THC that have been approved for nausea and vomiting and low appetite in cancer patients. Uh, and from there, we've also, over the past 10 to 20 years, been able to gather a lot of observational and, um, and, um, and, and data where we're looking at you know, more retrospective data where uh, we've seen patients that utilize cannabis, we know that they've had significant lower side effects during their treatment. And it's been across the board. It's not really just for nausea and vomiting. I've seen a lot of patients that have gotten an immense amount of pain relief from, with using cannabis, uh, an immense amount of relief from anxiety and depression using cannabis. And so I think there's a lot of applications for it. I just think that we're still kind of, um, we're still kind of, it's still difficult to navigate the, the landscape of it with patients, especially from state to state where the laws might be, you know, uh, you know contributing to uh, preventing access. So uh, I do spend a lot of time talking to patients about cannabis. Uh, and, uh, that is one of the, one of the uh, things that I, I've done a lot of research on myself and, actually published a paper on um, and so I think
think that um, that's something hopefully we'll continue to get more research on. There are other countries that are involved in research with, with uh, cannabis compounds and, and cancer. So I think that whether it's done here or overseas, you know, we're going to be getting more information in soon. Okay, so the last category of thing of therapies that I wanted to kind of just touch on were things that are more from a prevention standpoint. Uh, curcumin, we mentioned a little earlier, but probably one of the best uh, herbs or supplements or compounds we know out there that has a, a chemo preventative effect for numerous types of cancer. There's, there's studies, um, dozens of studies showing that curcumin acts on, on many different levels uh, in order to inhibit cancer cell growth, whether it's blocking you know, angiogenesis, which is you know, new blood vessel recruitment, or whether it's you know, blocking uh, tumor uh, or uh, uh, up regulating tumor suppressor genes or uh, decreasing inflammatory signaling. Uh, it really is, is, again, kind of one of those Swiss Army knives, kind of like melatonin, where uh, it can block cancer cell growth from many different angles. So uh, that's something that it's kind of like a almost like a cancer insurance supplement you know for patients that don't have cancer maybe have a high family risk a uh, high family uh, history of cancer that would be one of the first supplements i would recommend for them uh, the melatonin with with breast cancer again uh, uh, these studies go back quite a ways actually um, they did some studies with night shift nurses and uh, looking at you know they found that that night shift nurses and night shift workers in general had higher incidence, incidence, incidences of breast cancer. And later on, they found that the missing link was, was this lack of melatonin. And the fact that when they were sleeping during the day, they weren't getting adequate melatonin production in the brain. And so um, making sure that, you know, whether you're sleeping at the right time, you know, the, the right time or not, I think the melatonin can have this prevent, preventative effect and help you get into that more restful sleep where your immune system is acting more uh, is acting more on, uh, on helping to prevent cancer cell growth. Vitamin D, again, low vitamin D has been associated with just about every type of cancer. Uh, some of the, the best studies we have are with colorectal and prostate cancer. Uh, but I would say, you know, 80 to 90% of the patients I test um, that aren't on a high dose supplement already are low. And not just low, but like, you know, it's down in their toenails. Uh, so uh, that's one of the things that, again, I think the general public can take advantage of, make sure that their vitamin D level is. There's more things that we talk about that can help prevent uh, cancer. We have good, good studies behind. The one I want to talk a little bit um, in depth about was the reducing toxic exposures. Um, this, again, goes back to that environment, right? And I think that this is where you can get probably the most bang for your buck because so many carcinogens have been identified in our environment and in these types of products that we're exposed to on a daily basis. Uh, you know, for women, it's, it's a lot of these beauty products. It's a lot of household cleaners, uh, pesticides in foods, in, you know, in, in meats, in vegetables. I'm a big fan of the Environmental Working Group page. You go to their website, they always publish the latest as far as which foods are most heavily sprayed, which foods, you know, are, are the cleanest. And so you can use that as kind of a starting point to try to avoid pesticides in your food. Uh, plastics uh, contain a lot, especially soft plastics, contain a lot of what we call xenoestrogens, things that um, can kind of throw off estrogen metabolism, which we know is kind of a driver of a lot of breast cancer, you know, ovarian cancer. Uh, and so, um, there's a lot we can do to clean up our environment so that we're not being exposed to these things. And really, I think that that's where we are going to get the most bang for our buck going forward with, um, with bringing down the, the cancer incidence in our country and worldwide, steadily rising for a long time. Uh, dietary measures, you know, again, these are just. It's not like one diet for everybody, but uh, these are some of the ones that have been shown with specific types of cancer to be things to avoid. Uh, you know, in general, less less meat intake, animal protein intake, dairy, uh, increased fiber, 
and fatty acid intake. So, you know, fish, greens, and salads, and things like that have all been shown to be helpful. Uh, avoiding processed foods, and refined foods. I think for the most part, that's one of the first places we usually start with patients is try to cut that out of their diet. Just less, I call it fake food. Let, eat less fake food, eat more real food. And so that's kind of a, usually the first step, and that's something that has played out in the research. Uh, lifestyle modifications, you know, I think that a lot of this is aimed at reducing stress, right? It's aimed at bringing our body out of this state where, you know, we're, we're in a sympathetic state, we're, we're in a fight or flight response 24 seven, which is what a lot of people deal with, uh, whether it's due to, you know, mental stress, work-related stress, family-related stress. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things to be stressed about today. So I think that you have to take time and you have to look at activities that are going to uh, take you out of that state and put you in more of that restful parasympathetic state so that your body can heal and take a break from being, you know, from, from, from being in that fight, fight or flight response all the time. So for some people that's exercise, some people that's meditation, people that's you know being in the nature uh, but you gotta you can't miss that part of it I think because I think that is a part that oftentimes gets unaddressed uh, by the medical community okay so time wise we're doing pretty good I'm just gonna do a few quick case studies these are not you know super detailed cases they're not super long write-ups I just wanted you guys to get a feel for you know, a typical patient and what I might recommend. Um, this first one is a 63 year old male with stage three colorectal cancer. Uh, stage three meaning that it started in the colon and spread to uh, you know, some of the surrounding lymph nodes, but hasn't spread to any you know, distant sites or distant organs. Uh, and so he's undergoing chemo and radiation with a, an oral chemotherapy drug called amcitabine or Zolota. And you know, there could be a lot of side effects with this. Uh, the patients can get a lot of diarrhea, a lot of fatigue. Um, they can get uh, cracking and peeling on their hands and feet, numbness and tingling. Uh, and so, past medical history on him, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, osteoarthritis, kind of a very typical picture. He came in with kind of a severe drop in weight, uh, some loose stools already, sleep disturbances, joint pain, and, and fatigue. And uh, you know, no surprise, his vitamin D was low and his iron was low. So again, I did a lot of workup. We did a lot of labs. Um, we, you know, we never, we never want to guess on nutrient levels. We always want to test and make sure we know exactly where patients are at. So we do do a pretty extensive workup as far as looking at um, you know all their different levels of nutrients, their levels of hormones looking at uh, metabolic factors and uh, also looking at you know, things like neurotransmitters. Uh, so we kind of put the whole picture together and address people on that multidimensional uh, uh, state. So for him, IV vitamin C, two to three times a week. Uh, we, uh, we titrate the dose up, so we start them with a low dose and they're usually are getting up to, up to about 75 to 100 grams per IV. And this is something that usually, you know, I talked about with natural medicine, uh, oftentimes it takes time to, to start seeing results and benefits. I mean, vitamin C, probably more than any other treatment, I oftentimes see that even after that first IV, they notice that they, they have a better sense of well-being, they have better energy, you know, they, they tell me, gosh, I slept better that night. Uh, and so that's, again, why we like to get IV vitamin C going pretty early on. Uh, we did do mistletoe with him as well, uh, with the mistletoe A type. There's, there's a few different types of mistletoe and it depends on uh, preparation and what type of host tree that the mistletoe grows on. They have different, you know, different levels of the lectins in them. So for him, or for all patients really, when they're on active treatment, we usually recommend the mistletoe A type. It's because it, it's a little gentler than the other two uh, and tends to help more with the side effects. So got him on the, the, the subcutaneous injections of mistletoe, uh, got the vitamin D and iron repleted, probiotics to help with the diarrhea. Uh, and that's something that I, you know, even if patients aren't having diarrhea, I usually start a probiotic just because uh, it, it helps a lot of other things as well. Uh, fish oil, you know, with this history of hypertension and cholesterol, uh, 
definitely had that on board. Melatonin to help with sleep and immune function. Got him set up with our acupuncturist. Uh, he was using cannabis and found that it helped with appetite and pain. And um, of course, we, we, we got it in motion with a little bit of exercise. I'm pretty sure he wasn't doing anything. So it was kind of baby steps, literally, for him. But um, I think, again, that's, that's a piece you can't leave you can't leave out because um, it, it goes a long way in helping with all the, you know, the way that the body heals itself, the way it sleeps, the way it eats, you know, your bowel movements, you know, the exercise is crucial for that. Uh, stress reduction, uh, his was, I, I, I remember this guy and he was, he was just kind of one of the easiest going guys and didn't need a ton of stress reduction, but um, I always like to get that piece in there. Uh, he was, you know, one of those guys where he's like, I, I try to meditate, but you know, after a minute, I just can't keep the thoughts coming into my head. And so he's like, I never feel like I'm really doing it well. And, uh, you know, one of the, one of the hallmarks of meditation is that you, you know, it's a practice. You're never going to be like perfect at it. It's never going to be a completely peaceful, quiet mind. So it's a matter of just continuing with it. And over time you get better at it. Um, and then diet, got to mean, you know, less red meat, more fiber. And then daily tree nuts is one specifically for colorectal cancer. Uh, it's been shown, there was a study a few years ago, uh, pretty phenomenal study and a large study that showed that uh, colorectal cancer patients, after they had completed treatment, they looked at dietary habits of these patients and the ones that were eating daily tree nuts, again, these are, you know, like cashews and walnuts and almonds, not peanuts, peanuts aren't nuts, they're legumes. Uh, but the ones that were eating daily tree nuts had a, about a 50% less risk of so I always tell people like, gosh, if that was a medication or a drug, you wouldn't be here in the end of that, right? So all of my colorectal cancer patients are, you know, they get their daily treatments no matter what. Um, the second one, uh, breast cancer patient, again, early stage, stage two. So she had one small lymph node uh, in her um, in her arm, in her axilla armpit, uh, and. Uh, she was ERPR positive, HER2 negative. So that's estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor. So we'll oftentimes just call that hormone positive. Uh, and that means that those are things that are driving her cancer. Uh, the HER2 is another mutation that some breast cancer patients have, and that's another driver of their growth. And it's, it's not to be a, you know, a sign of a more aggressive type when it's positive, but they also have drugs that specifically target that, that mutation. So in a way, yes, it makes it more aggressive, but it also gives patients another option to treat their to treat their uh, to treat their disease, uh, so she was getting chemo. Neoadjuvant is the type of chemo they get before a surgery. Helps to kind of shrink it up. The idea is that they shrink it up so they can get a better, um, uh, an easier um, uh, extraction of the tumor, cleaner margins. Uh, in some patients, you know, they go through chemo the chemotherapy. Really does a good job of, of shrinking tumors. Usually, some patients it completely shrinks it so they can't even see it on a scan. So that's why. They'll put in like some clips sometimes so that they know where the exactly where the tumor was. Um, so she was getting a regimen with AC, which is the adriamycin that we talked about earlier. So if you guys are paying attention, right, you'll you'll remember which which uh, supplement I recommended for her. Um, and then cytoxin is the other drug there, and then that's followed by 12 weeks of taxol. So she was obese, had history of IBS, uh, thyroid. Very strong connection between breast cancer and thyroid dysfunction. So I see that almost, almost across the board with my breast cancer patients is that there's thyroid dysfunction. And um, so that's something that oftentimes needs to be addressed. And uh, sometimes they're, you know, they might be on thyroid medication, but they haven't had a really good thorough workup. And so either getting them to a, a, you know, a functional endocrinologist or, you know, an the doctor that does have expertise there is, is a good thought. She was also diabetic, so she had a couple, you know, significant risk factors working against her as far as overall terrain, um, fatigue, you know, she was having alternating constipation, diarrhea, of course, with IBS, hot flashes, another common symptom in breast cancer, uh, especially when they're going through treatment, poor sleep, anxiety, depression. So again, a typical picture um, and really kind of suffering on multiple dimensions, right? Mind, body, spirit. Had low vitamin D, again, not surprisingly, and low B12. 
So we got her on IV vitamin C as well. Um, we just did once a week during the week she was getting chemo, but then the week she was off, we would do two to three uh, IVs. Again, we wanted to shoot for at least three a week because that's been shown to be the most beneficial. Uh, mistletoe therapy, we had her on the um, Elixir A to start, but she did well with that, so we actually moved over to the Elixir M, which is a little stronger. And uh, when we did, she actually, I remember, had a really strong skin reaction and spiked some pretty high fevers with it. Um, but I think that the mistletoe played a, an important role in her uh, having such a phenomenal response to her treatment. I think she was one of the ones that basically got to the point they couldn't find her tumor when they scanned it again uh, before doing surgery. And so, you know, I call that sort of a healing crisis when patients go through, you know, that really intense kind of reaction to something. So we had to back down the, the mistletoe a little bit on the dose because of her reaction, but I still think that it kind of shook her system up a little bit and, and, and got her immune system engaged. And I think she went on to do you know, just really well after that. I think that was a key point, a key you know ingredient in that success. Uh, the probiotic again, magnesium for hot flashes, CoQ10, right? We talked about that to offset that cardiotoxicity. Um, melatonin got her sleeping better. Uh, exercise specifically yoga. Breast cancer is one that we, we recommend. And then uh, mind body medicine work, you know, the, some of those techniques helped with her anxiety and depression. We did do food allergy testing with her as well, just because um, her picture, I just, I had a feeling she was a very heavy, uh, very heavy milk drinker, ate a lot of cheese, a lot of ice cream. Um, and so I had a suspicion that she might have a dairy issue. And uh, so I went ahead and ordered the test because usually patients are much more inclined to get off of the food if you show them, you know, the actual test. Uh, and so we did that and uh, sure enough, she was, you know, through the roof uh, on her on her dairy intolerance. And so got her off the dairy. I think that was also another important uh, ingredient to her success. She, I remember she had a pretty dramatic weight loss right away. In a few weeks, she dropped, you know, 15, 20 pounds and just felt better. Just got rid of a lot of the excess weight that she didn't need and um, you know, had better energy, slept better. So these are just kind of typical, you know, cases, typical treatment plans that I'll put together. And um, I think that wraps up the, the lecture. So we'll take questions from the audience. I don't know if we have online question availability as well. Questions? Yes. Do you have certain oncologists um, that you work with that you would recommend? I am, I've been in <laughs> Overland Park for about two weeks, so oh, okay. I'm still getting my, my Rolodex of, uh, of contacts and referrals and all that. Uh, I have seen quite a few patients already from KU Med, and so I do have some, some reaching out I need to do to some of the oncologists there. And I do know that they have a history of you know, working with integrative medicine at KU, so I'm hoping we can make some inroads there, but it's a little bit again. You'd have to go through Dr. Nan. She did the IVC studies yes. at KU. Yes, and so yeah, Dr. Nia is uh, my counterpart at, at the Reardon Clinic here in Overland Park. She's uh, an integrative medical doc MD. She went to KU and she spent some time at KU Med and um, like you said, was involved in some of that research and worked with uh, well, Dr. Drisco. <laughs> yes, and so she's already been getting me plugged in with a lot of that. So uh, anybody that comes to our clinic, we'll make sure that Again, we want to work alongside the oncologists. We want to be collaborative. Uh, we want them to see us as a part of the team. So we're not here to you know, tell patients not to do conventional treatment. We just want to make sure we get the best of both worlds. I have a question um, in regards to cannabis. Like you talked about some of the medications have the TCH in it for like pain. THC. THC, sorry, yeah. And then but I've been hearing a lot about the, the CBD, CBD oil, yep. the oil, like extracting that without that. It's like, what are your thoughts on that? So again, we need better research, but yeah, so there's two main compounds in, uh, in the cannabis plant. There's THC, which we've known about for a long time. That's, that's the, you know, the uh, addictive part of it, which you know, has the psychoactive effects, um, but also helps with more of the nausea and appetite aspect. And then there's CBD, which has been shown to have other effects in the body. It doesn't produce a high. Um, it's actually not, um, it's not regulated by the FDA, so you, 
you know, these are these products that you're seeing online or that you see you know, these shops selling. Uh, it's not considered marijuana unless it has over a certain percentage of THC in it. It's like 0.03%. So all these cannabis strains, these uh, CBD, high CBD strains, kind of, you know, have, they have a tiny bit of THC in it, but not enough to really have an effect. Um, their use, as far as the scientific evidence has shown, is, you know, is more of a potential immune effect in the body. It's been shown to help with seizures. It's been shown to have some uh, effects for decreasing anxiety. I think, I think what we're gonna find, and I think a lot of the other countries that are doing cannabis research um, are using products that have both compounds in them and to different ratios. And I think that we have enough evidence that shows that there is a synergistic effect between the THC and the CBD. We don't, I don't think we quite know, you know, for each patient situation, what that ideal balance and ideal formula and ratio looks like. But um, I think there's benefit to both compounds. And there's some situations where you might just use THC or you might just use CBD. But I know a lot of the, you know, phase two and phase three studies that are going on overseas, they're using combinations of the two. Yeah. Like I've taken for pain management in general, like that wasn't on your one, the list you kind of talked about, but I didn't know. I, now, for pain management specifically, and if, and if patients aren't in a, in a state where they can get medical marijuana, I have recommended CBD, and I have seen fairly positive results. Uh, some patients need to really push the dose. Um, I've, a lot of the patients that I come in and say they've tried it and they, and they didn't have good results, they, didn't take it, they weren't taking very high doses. And you know, it's, you know, at, at higher doses it can get quite expensive, but um, I think it is a good tool. And, I've had patients that have you know, been able to completely get off of opiates, you know, using um, both, you know, blended compounds and just straight CBD. So I think there's a role for it there. We have an online question. Sure. Um, it says, do you find that patients need vein ports to do IVC treatments uh, that frequently during cancer treatment? It always helps. <laughs> I mean, it's just, you know, it's easier access. It's, prevents having to stick them as much, especially if they're getting you know, three IVs a week. Most patients that are going through chemo or something like that already have a port in. Uh, if they don't have a port, you know, we kind of just talk them through you know, the benefits and risks of it, um, but it usually makes the, the IV treatments a, little, a lot easier to tolerate on their, on their end. And I know at, in the Wichita Clinic, we have patients who have ports and, yes. and we do use them. When yes, available. yeah, no, if, if they have them, that's what we use. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah, another one? Um, yeah, I noticed that pretty much everything you talked about today was in conjunction with chemo or standard care. Do you have an approach if that's not what somebody wants to do? Yeah, I mean, you know, we always, um, we're always gonna meet patients where they're at. And for some patients, they're just, you know, either they've been through conventional treatment and didn't have a good experience or, you know, they just, you know, from the get-go are, are against going down that road. Um, as long as patients are well informed of what their options are and you know what the risks and benefits of everything are, you know, we'll absolutely try to support them any way we can. Uh, I do think that patients generally get the best approach when they do an integrative model, when they combine both. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I've I've treated patients that you know, did decline conventional treatment. And, you know, have been down that road with them as well. Uh, I wouldn't say it, it doesn't change my philosophy or my approach as much, uh, other than depending on what stage they're at, we might be a little more aggressive, or, you know, we might be a little more, if it's, you know, later stages, we might be a little less aggressive and just focus on more quality of life. Mm -hmm. Do you guys do any kind of extreme nutrition protocols, like the Gerson method or anything? Like that. Yeah, it's it's a good question. A lot of patients ask about Gerson and you know, Budwig diet, fasting, mm -hmm. things like that. I think that all of those protocols have been uh, have their place, and, and a lot of those diet therapies are usually used in conjunction with other protocols. A lot of people talk about the Gerson diet, but there's actually a lot more facets to the Gerson approach, um, and so. I think there are certain pieces of 
of, of other diet therapies, cancer diet therapies out there that I that I do agree with. Uh, we don't have a you know extreme diet that we recommend for all of our patients. Um, oftentimes, like I said, we're you know, depending on where the patients are at when they come to us. Sometimes that first step is just getting them off the fake food and eating real food, and then from there we take maybe another step to you know lowering the animal protein and getting more fruits and vegetables in. And maybe from there we start things like intermittent fasting, which is something I'm a big fan of. Uh, I usually will recommend intermittent fasting pro a few days prior and a few days after each chemotherapy, because that has actually been shown. There's a, a doctor out of um, USC, Dr. Longo, who's done a lot of uh, uh, studies with cancer patients and, and doing fasting and doing uh, uh, caloric restriction, mm -hmm. and uh, shown that the patients get fewer side effects. They actually maintain their weight better I mean it's and they have better overall responses when they do that fasting around their treatments so it makes sense because when you fast you're pretty much putting your healthy cells into more of a um, more of a sleep mode you know more of a protective state uh, hibernation if you will and so it, you know, the cancer cells don't necessarily have that mechanism to do that so it makes them more exposed and more vulnerable to those treatments the ketogenic diet I say I would say would be the only diet that I you know readily recommend that is more of an extreme diet yeah uh, and it is it is fairly extreme so it's, it's it's one of those that I guess would technically fall into that category yeah hopefully not what mainstream thinks that it is with the processed meats and bacon and no all that. and that's I have a lot of um, you know keto people that come in and you know they're living on bacon and cheese right and I'm like no, that's not, that's, not. To be. that's like, you know, you're like, you're trying to, you know, utilize a loophole here. It's, mm -hmm. That's not what, that's not the intention of the diet. Um, and so, yeah, there's some re-education that we need to do <laughs> around the ketogenic diet with patients for sure. All right. Well, I guess we'll wrap it up there and uh, we'll hopefully see you all in about a month for part two of the series. Yeah. Yeah.